Good morning, everyone. The drone footage you just saw is of this really awesome campsite that I just found this morning here in western Colorado. I didn't camp here last night. I just pulled over here 20 minutes ago as I was driving along the, the main highway through the area. And I pulled over because I had actually marked this spot on, on the GPS app on my phone. I use an app called Gaia GPS to help me plan my trips and figure out where I want to go and what things I want to see and do. And at some point in the past, I had marked this spot as the confluence of two rivers, the San Miguel River and the Dolores River. They meet right here, and from this point, which is also a campsite, you can see that confluence. So let me show it to you. So here's one river. This is the Dolores River coming in right here. And then it continues to flow on down the canyon this way. This is the San Miguel River coming in from here. You can't quite see the confluence from this spot. It's it's like right here. This cliff is, the top of this cliff is blocking the view, but right here is where the two meet. And you saw that also in the drone footage, but just a really spectacular area. And I think I'm actually going to, you know, again, this was not planned, but now that I'm here and now that I'm seeing the, the rivers here and I'm, I'm seeing a road, so a road goes alongside both rivers here. This dirt road right here, and it continues around the bend, around the bend of the confluence, and it continues along the, the, the San Miguel River over there. I want to get down there. Let's go drive down to the confluence. Uh, I looked on the map, and, and there's a bridge a couple miles upstream here, so presumably the bridge is open. I don't know, it might be damaged or something, but let's assume that it's open so we can go across the bridge and and drive down along here to the confluence. And here we are at the bottom of the canyon. It really didn't take too long, maybe 15 minutes. But I was up here at the start of the video. I'm at the confluence. Uh, the San Miguel River comes in through here. And then you can see it's water joining that of the Dolores River right here. So this is the Dolores River with the water from the San Miguel coming in from here. And if you were so inclined, you could camp right here at the confluence. And the road just keeps going for miles and miles. So I'm I'm going to guess that there are a lot of campsites along here if, if you wanted to camp along the river. Big cliffs on all sides. I think you can kayak down these rivers at certain times of the year. They might be too low in the middle of the summer, but in the spring, when there's runoff, when the water is higher, I think there is kayaking. And um, I passed something in the canyon a couple minutes ago as I was driving here that I've seen from a different angle before, or I've seen a different section of it from a different angle. And I want to go back, I want to double back and show that part to you guys. So you can see in the, the side of the cliff here across the river, these pieces of wood sticking out. On some of these, it's just a regular just like a single piece of wood sticking out on others. It's a kind of a, a triangle shape. And then right here, this is a reconstructed section of what it would have looked like originally. This is a 48 foot long reconstructed section of what was a hanging flume. And so what that means is that basically this was a, an open channel or tube along the side of the canyon meant to provide water. It carried water to, I think, some mines, to some mining operations in the area. They needed clean water to do that, and so they built this several mile long flume along the side of this canyon. This was reconstructed about 10 years ago, and they used big planks along the side and the bottom, and yeah, really interesting. So from where I was earlier on top of the canyon, 
you know, that, that place again where I started the video. Just around the corner from there, there's another viewpoint from above of the flume, of a different section of flume. And I have shown that in a video before. I'll put a link to that in the, in the video description. It was like, it was a while ago. It was like four or five years ago, one of the earlier videos on this channel. I think I'm gonna go back there right now and give you uh, another look at it uh, now that I have a, a better camera and everything. Uh, let's go take another look at that spot that's above. But before we do that, I wanna talk about something that I noticed on the car last night. So this is a 2001 GMC Yukon and I've had it for uh, eight months now, something like that. And the back lifts up, which I like. And ever since I've gotten it, I've had this, this mesh, this mosquito netting in here so that on nice nights I can have that open and get a lot of great airflow. And my working assumption has been that if it's raining this will also protect rain from getting in here. And I've done this when it's sprinkled a little bit at night and it, it protected it just fine. No water was able to get in here. But it rained all night last night, it rained quite a bit. And this morning when I woke up I noticed that my sleeping bag was damp and there was water on the screen here and so I think what happened is that water like there's a, a gap right here where this light is I think water was getting in through there and then just coming down here like there is there is a lip on this rubber seal here and so I thought that that would keep water from getting in but it didn't uh, I understand that water could get in from the sides here like if it's raining and there's wind water can come in and, and get this section wet but there was water also like little drops of water on the middle section so I'm not entirely sure how that happened I think when I get home I need to use the hose and and uh, recreate a, a little rainstorm and see exactly how water is getting in here something I might end up doing is making a little tent or simple tarp covering just a piece of fabric piece of material like a rectangle that goes over here over the top then little triangles on the ends here so that basically the top is covered and then the the sides are also covered i know that there are suv tents you can get that cover the entire back side but that's too much hassle and, and i don't need or want that much coverage or, or extra space or anything and so I might just whip up a quick little thing to see if I can minimize the water getting in because another issue is that on this car, when you roll down these side windows, normally in a car you would expect there to be, you know, if you roll down the windows a couple inches, you'd expect it to be, a, you know, a couple inch gap right here. And there is, but that gap continues over here. Let me roll down the windows a little bit and, and show you what I mean. Okay, so you'll notice there's the gap here. And then there's also a gap right along here. This continues all the way down. So these deflector things can protect water or keep water from getting in right here, but they don't go over far enough. They don't come down enough to keep water from getting in here, which is a bummer. It's one design flaw, I think, of this particular vehicle. I could use the front windows. I could roll down the front windows because this is full coverage along here. But the problem is I have window, I've got screens, got window screens in this, in these side windows. And it's, they're always in there. And I like it because when I get to a campsite, I can just roll down the back windows and I'm done. I don't need to get those. You know, there are companies that make external window screens that magnet onto the outside of the window. I don't want to deal with that. I love just being able to roll down my rear windows. But again, the issue with these windows when it's raining is that water can get in from the side. So there's just not really a perfect solution for this particular vehicle. I think my best bet maybe is if it is pretty rainy to just make a little tarp here and uh, make a little awning sort of thing out, out the back and we'll see how it works. The great thing about this style of camping for me is that I can just roll into a campsite and I'm done. I don't need to set up a tent, no tarps, no nothing. You know, it's very easy, a very low friction style of camping. And the more things you add to the outside, you know, with the awning or the, the little tent on the back, it's just, it makes it less and less simple and that's not ideal for me. When the weather is nice, when it's not raining, no issues, but I need to figure out a better system for when it is raining. Anyway, just wanted to relate that to you guys. Let me know if you do want to see me make a little, a little 
whatever, a little awning for the back here. Let's get out of here. Let's drive up to the top viewpoint of the flume. Again, it's not this particular section of flume that you can see from the top. It's a different section. Uh, let's go drive up there and I'll, I'll show you the view from above. Okay, so on the side of the road here, we have this nice little historical marker that gives a little bit of information about the flume. And yes, yeah, so the, the flume itself was 13 miles long, or at least there was a canal and flume system that was 13 miles long. And it says the last five miles of the flume clung to the wall of the canyon itself. And yeah, the water was needed to work the gold mines in the area. And from this viewpoint here, there's a great look, great view down at the river and then also of the hanging flume. If we zoom in here, this is the closest section of flume. This is unrestored. And it just continues along the wall of the canyon here. So for five miles total, it ran along the side of the canyon. Just imagine the work, the amount of work it, it took to make that, just unreal. One thing I didn't have the last time I visited this place is the drone. So I'm going to launch the drone, fly it over the flume, see if we can get a closer look at it and uh, fly alongside it a little bit. Let's hop back in the car and drive down the road here. I think the theme today, the general theme, is to see things and do things that I've wanted to see and do for years, for a long time, but haven't gotten around to yet. This area, this western, far western Colorado area that's kind of south of Grand Junction, it's not really on the way to anything. You, you kind of have to have to make a point to go there, to go here. And so just over the years, I've accumulated this, these lists of things that I wanted to see and do in this area, but my route usually hasn't taken me over here. But on this trip, I want to cross some of those things off my list, and we'll see how many of those we can get done today. Uh, that, that first viewpoint, the, the viewpoint of the confluence, that was, like I said, that's been on, my, on the map for a while, on my, in my app for a while. I looked at the date. I added that in 2017, uh, and several of these other things I've been wanting to get to for a while also. So anyway, let's get back in the car and head on to the next spot. Okay, so it's about an hour later, and I spent most of that time driving along the Dolores River and then I turned left and went up a canyon with a little dirt road running through it. And then that canyon opens up into this crazy looking valley, and that's where I am right now. I want to show it to you guys. But first I want to show it to you on my phone so you can see the, the weird shape of this valley. Here I am, this little blue dot right here in Google Maps. This valley is the shape of an egg. It's like a dinosaur egg. It's a little bit longer than a chicken egg, for example. I've been looking at this on maps for years and thought, that is so weird looking. I want to go there and I never have until right now. There's just this little isolated valley. I mean, it's a big valley, but little isolated area and kind of at the, the edge of the mountains and the desert. It's where the, the mountains and the desert meet. And it's just, it's really, really pretty. If we zoom in right here, this is the skinny little canyon that I came in through, right there. And then the walls of the valley. This is called Sinbad Valley. It's like being surrounded by fortress walls. This place feels like I wouldn't be surprised to see dinosaurs across the landscape, you know? Like, it feels like a, a lost world sort of situation, but an inverse of that, instead of this, like, high, isolated plateau that's been cut off from the rest of the world for thousands or millions of years. It's this indentation in the Earth that's cut off from the rest of the world for thousands or millions of, of years. That's what it feels like to be here. And, you know, I just imagine waterfalls going over the, 
the edge of the cliffs behind me. It just feels very separate and kind of exotic almost, especially with this this dramatic lighting and the clouds and the snow that we have going on right now. This valley is almost entirely in Colorado. The very back corner of it that you can't really see over here, it's, I, think it's, I think it's this corner over here. That's in Utah, but it's almost entirely in Colorado. And then I think on the, on the rim of the canyon here, I guess this would be kind of the western edge of the valley, there's a road up there, I think. I saw it on the map. Uh, it's not something I could do this time of year. Like, as you can see, there's still, still snow up there. But that would be fun to do for a future adventure. And then this valley, the valley itself is, is a mix of private and public lands. Basically the middle of it here is a ranch. It's a private ranch. And then to the sides, both on that end, the north end, and then on this end where I am right now, this is public land. There's nothing really I want to do or see while I'm here. Um, I don't have any hike planned or anything like that. I just wanted to come here to see it myself for the first time in years of, of looking at it on the map. Just because, again, it is so weird looking on the map. And I... Ow! <laughs> I just stepped in a cactus. I think the plan now is to leave this area I leave this area south of Grand Junction, and I'm going to drive into Grand Junction, which is the main city in western Colorado here. I'm going to go there, run some errands, nothing too terribly interesting. I guess I'll see you guys probably in, in a few hours. What time is it? It's 11.30, so yeah, we've got time to, to see and do some other things today after I go run some errands. But uh, let me give you one last look at the valley here. There's very little information about this place online, but I did see one person call it the most remote place in Colorado. I guess it depends where you're coming from. If you're coming from Denver, yeah, I could see that. If you're coming from the Front Range, that makes sense. But if you're coming from Utah, like I am, it's pretty close, pretty accessible. Hi guys, several hours later now. It is about four o'clock. I'm done with Grand Junction. I'm about an hour north of town now. And uh, this area is called Canyon Pintado, or Painted Canyon. And there are a ton of rock art sites in here. I'm not gonna visit most of them. I'm just gonna go to two, this one, and then one like a mile down the road, if that. They're both basically roadside attractions and uh, pretty unique. So here's the first site that I wanted to see. It's called the Waving Hands site, or the White Hands site, and it's a, about the size of my hands. Got a little bird right here. And then I don't know if these are old or not. These could be more historic, you know, maybe from like the 1800s or something, but not sure. And then some other just like graffiti kind of stuff around it, unfortunately. I'm now at the second site, which again is just down the road a little bit. It's also roadside. You can see it. I can see it from where I'm parked here. It's a large pictograph. There are a few of them, but the, the main one is a Cocopelli figure. And Cocopelli was a Native American god, a god of fertility and a trickster god. And he's depicted as a humpbacked figure playing a flute. And Cocopelli, like the name Cocopelli, has been used for all sorts of things now. You'll find gift shops named Cocopelli, you'll find trails named Cocopelli, other businesses named that. Like it's a very common name for things in the southwestern US. And then also the Cocopelli figure has become kind of a symbol of the Southwest also. So you'll see Cocopelli figure decals or stickers on cars, for example. And also interestingly, archaeologists have been able to to map out locations of Cocopelli figures, like of, of petroglyphs and pictographs. And by doing that, they can figure out, okay, these areas were culturally related somehow. I mean, it could be cultural or it could be uh, through trade they're related, or maybe linguistically, you know, whatever. In some way, these groups are, were all connected because they all share this common figure, this common deity. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, anyway, let's go take a closer look at it. Okay, so here we are. There's a little viewing area and some informational signs, and then 
right above it is the pictograph panel. And there are three here, three different panels. And Cocopelli is the one in the middle here. And it's a surprisingly large pictograph. That's about four feet tall, that figure. And you can see how that, that slab of rock, that piece of rock that it's on, is uh, being held onto the cliff with a, a steel cable there just to make sure it doesn't fall off. But as I zoom in here, you can see there's his head, there's his flute, his little hunchback. Now, I don't know what the rest of the stuff around him is, but really neat. Then there's this guy on the right. I'm not sure what that is. And then this over here on the left. And this area was named Canyon Pintado by the Dominguez Escalante expedition, which is a famous expedition. If you've learned about the exploration of the American West, you've probably heard of that. It was in 1776, way before this was part of the United States. And uh, they came through here and they saw figures like this. They saw these pictographs and they, they named the canyon Painted Canyon because of that. And uh, now I'm gonna, let's see. I need dinner. I'm gonna go drive into into a town north of here called Rangeley, here in, in northwestern Colorado. And then I'm going to go see the last thing of the day that I wanted to see. And again, this is something that I've wanted to see for years and years. And again, it's not really on the way to anything. You have to go out of your way to get there. And so that's what I'm doing today. All right, welcome to Rangeley. And for dinner here, I'm gonna have some Chinese food. There's a place called California Walk that got decent reviews on Google Maps. And I haven't had Chinese food yet on this trip, so that's what I'm gonna go for. And here's the result. Got some Kung Pao chicken and some fried rice and a fortune cookie and a little piece of candy. Looks pretty good. I'm gonna go ahead and eat as much of this as I can, and then I'll see you guys at the next spot, which is about an hour away in Utah. All right, guys, we are now at the final destination of the day. Really interesting little place. It's called Fantasy Canyon. And it's a little wonderland of fantastically shaped rocks. Let's go explore a little bit. I almost feel bad for these rocks. They look like tortured souls. Really, really crazy shapes. And it's a large area. It's an extensive area from the parking lot it looks pretty small, but I mean, it, it goes on for a while here. Well, if you couldn't tell, this is just a wild place. I, I mean, I've seen a lot of rocks. I've seen a lot of rocks in Utah, but this is pretty darn unique. Like it's, it's dripping wax almost. It's much more organic looking. Yeah, the, the gray color is, is unique. Usually Utah rock formations are brown, red, orange, tan. But no, this, this is gray. And this is, this is worth coming out here for. This is remote. This is out in the middle of nowhere, surrounded just by oil drilling platforms, oil derricks, and not a whole lot else. Really, really unique place. So I've got about half an hour or 20 minutes of daylight left. I've got two options. I could either camp somewhere around here on BLM land, or I could drive two or three hours tonight and get closer to where I want to be in the morning. And I think I'm going to choose the latter. I'm going to drive tonight in the dark. I'm going to go find a campsite in the dark 
and I'll show you the campsite once I get there. It might be tonight or it might be in the morning. If I'm still at that campsite in the morning, if, I'm, if I don't leave before it gets light tomorrow morning, then uh, I'll show you camp. Either way, I'll, uh, I'll see you there somewhere back over in Colorado. Good morning. It's about 7.45 the next morning and I'm camped out. Let's see, I'm in Utah. No, I'm in Colorado, right? <laughs> I'm in Colorado, out in the middle of nowhere out here. The campsite itself isn't the greatest. I just pulled off the side of a dirt road running through this broad valley here, but pretty nice mountain views. It's quiet. Just birds and ground squirrels making noise. I had several other wildlife encounters yesterday once I stopped filming. Uh, I nearly hit about a hundred deer and elk driving here. They were just everywhere. So that was a little bit nerve-wracking, but we made it through. And then while it was still light, uh, you know, pretty soon after I left Fantasy Canyon, I saw a few different herds of wild horses, and that was a lot of fun. Uh, I was able to capture one of them on film, so I'll show that to you here. There's a group of like four or five maybe, and then I saw another group of half a dozen, then another group of maybe three. And then I realized that I also forgot to tell you about the Chinese food, and uh, it was good. I mean, it was wasn't incredible, but it was perfectly fine for a quick dinner uh, for Chinese food in the middle of nowhere in Colorado, so no complaints there. I'm going to drive about 15 minutes from here to the spot that I'm going to be starting the next video at. I'm going to start recording that video pretty quick here, so I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you have any questions. Let me know what your favorite part was. I'll see you in the next one. Be sure to check out Adventure Know How, my new site, where you can gain access to a map of all of my free campsites, plus monthly bonus videos that you won't find anywhere else. Learn more at adventureknowhow.com. And for links to everything else SUV RVing related, visit suvrving.com. Links to these sites and more will be in the video description.